So today we're beginning a new author, uh, and that is uh, Jean-Louis Chrétien, uh, from this book specifically, Hand to Hand, Listening to the Work of Art. And I'm also going to be today reading uh, a few passages from one of the readings that was struck from the original syllabus from this work, uh, The Arc of Speech, which um, is from the chapter entitled The Hospitality of Silence, to give a bit of uh, context to this uh, discussion of silence in painting. So first of all, a bit of background and context. Uh, these are mostly reminders from things that we previously discussed, but are we worth uh, setting this up a bit to motivate uh, Cretien's interest in this whole topic and subject matter of silence and painting, which can seem to be rather esoteric and um, it might not be clear exactly what the philosophical interest or significance of this is. And so uh, what I've got here is a little uh, assemblage of some important aspects of Cretien's lineage, uh, which are familiar to us. So first of all, there's Heidegger's idea that language is the house of being, a famous quote from Heidegger. Uh, and we can pair that with Gadamer's idea that we looked at uh, when we were looking at the end of Truth and Method. Uh, being that can be understood is language. And so there's this um, understanding of a relationship between the form in which uh, language manifests itself and the reality that exists for us. And language comes to have a kind of quasi-prophetic um, function in these philosophers because of the way in which it can body forth being, and the way in which it can um, draw a world out of the earth, for example, to take the Heideggerian version of this, or the way that it can uh, situate us uh, within history for someone like Gadamer. Now, um, Chrétien is going to be interested in the continuation of this exploration, this phenomenological and hermeneutic exploration into the uh, deep nature of language, the reality of language, uh, the way in which language embodies itself in various forms, and of course, in particular, in the way in which it embodies itself in art. And the relationship between language in the more familiar or straightforward verbal sense and language uh, in painting, the language of painting, as some philosophers of art uh, will refer to it. So also within the background here is the a transformation of the Heideggerian problematic in Levinas and Derrida. In particular, this idea that I think in this course we looked at perhaps most um, extensively in Vatimo, uh, the idea of the forgetting of being, which can be viewed as the forgetting of the ontological difference, the uh, immersion in beings in, in the ontic level of experience or phenomena to the exclusion of being, the being that makes beings to be and that gives them their intelligibility. So this, this sort of forgetting of being, which has dire consequences in Heidegger and Gadamer and Levinas and Derrida, uh, in the form of Levinas and Derrida, uh, or in the um, way in which it's discussed in Levinas and Derrida, tends to take the form of an interest in the ways in which otherness uh, is suppressed. And um, conversely, the ways in which we might welcome otherness. And that's um, often described as, especially in Derrida, as hospitality, as welcoming the other. And in thinkers like uh, Jean-Luc Marion and Chrétien, who are writing um, in the wake of the influence of uh, Derrida's interpretation of Heidegger and Levinas, this idea of hospitality is also very important. And so thus, in this work, The Arc of Speech, uh, from Chrétien, we have a chapter entitled The Hospitality of Silence, which gives us some uh, background that would have uh, been nice to have to set up this piece. I think it stands on its own, um, but 
I'm going to try to fill in a little bit more about what that notion of the hospitality of silence is. But you should know that the, the general idea of hospitality here is this idea from, from Derrida in particular, uh, what it is to welcome otherness. And being um, in this respect, or whatever the alternate name for being uh, has to be, uh, if you're Derrida, difference, for example, or something like that, there are many names for it. Uh, but that, in order for that to um, remember that, one needs to be able to welcome it, to have a kind of hospitality. And hospitality also, of course, has just a a basic sort of um, ethical dimension to it that um, fits in well with Levinas's concern with ethics. Namely, what would it be for me to um, actually acknowledge the other as other? in her full otherness rather than attempting to um, instrumentalize the other or in other words in some way suppress their otherness. So that's um, part of what's going on here in this uh, whole problematic of hospitality as well. Okay, so that brings us to Chrétien then and probably uh, the um, phrase or the uh, dichotomy that uh, Chrétien is most associated with philosophically is that between call and response. And this has a, a religious background, the religious idea of the vocation, uh, the calling, um, you know, throughout the Bible, there's, especially in the Old Testament, there's this, um, well, in both the Old and the New Testament, but originally in the Old Testament, there's this uh, moment or scene in which God, the Lord, Yahweh, calls the prospective prophet and the prophet has to answer um, the classic answer here i am uh, i respond to your call uh, here i am lord i will follow your um your prescriptions for me and the response but uh, one of the things that is distinctive about Chrétien's understanding of this is that he uses this call-response structure in order to understand the deep nature of language that's, that's a concern since um, Heidegger and Gadamer and Derrida. And that is, uh, his understanding is that all speech is a kind of response to some call. And there you can definitely see also the uh, influence of Levinas, which we've covered in our discussion of Marion, the, the way in which the face represents a call of the other. The call or the claim on you to do something or to not do something, uh, not to kill the other, not to abuse the other. So there's a sense in which uh, for uh, Levinas, we are always already uh, responding to a call whenever we recognize the face, because we are recognizing the face through this call. And I think Chrétien takes this kind of idea and uh, extends it to the analysis of speech and the concern with speech. Now, one aspect of this is his interpretation of silence itself as not merely a privation, not merely an absence of sound or speech or noise, but rather as a part of speech itself, as a kind of uh, call that speech responds to. So there's already a kind of potential speech or in a pregnant um, speech that has not yet been given birth in silence. We have this idea of a pregnant silence, but that's one of the things that uh, Chrétien is particularly concerned to analyze. Uh, Chrétien is also famous for analyzing various uh, inconspicuous phenomena of one kind or another. And this goes along also with later Heidegger and, and the idea of the um, the inconspicuous or the unapparent as it's sometimes translated or mistranslated by Mariam. Um, this idea that there's um, a kind of track that we can follow to being uh, or the nothing or difference or whatever name um, 
is suitable for it. Uh, the fourfold, all these different names that Heidegger gives it in his later work. Whether we can we can trace that track through the inconspicuous, and that we follow out um, our search for being by attending to inconspicuous phenomena that are normally overlooked, and certainly silence uh, would be a good candidate for one of those, and so, and thus uh, Chrétien. Um, focuses attention on the phenomenology of silence. Now, Chrétien, like Marion, is a French Catholic thinker, and he is not at all shy about um, identifying this um, ultimate reality um, with God and with the Christian tradition, uh, specifically the mystical tradition translated through um, the tradition of Catholic spirituality, and so he's often in dialogue with figures like the Church Fathers, uh, with Neoplatonic philosophy that was very influential on, the, on those early fathers and the like, and in, in, in kind of marrying it with um, contemporary uh, phenomenological methods to uh, suggest ways in which the divine uh, can be um, sort of um, uh, sussed out in some way or... Um, tracked in a way that uh, perhaps is easily overlooked and ignored given all the noise of modern ways of thinking. So that's Chrétien in a nutshell. Now the final thing I have here under the hospitality of silence um, suggests two kind of basic ways uh, that might be too strong, but they're the two ways that he, hi he highlights in, in this book, uh, The Arc of Speech. Um, silence as listening and silence as excess. Silence as listening and silence as excess. And I want to just uh, read a couple passages that he cites in uh, this chapter from The Ark of Speech, uh, entitled The Hospitality of Silence, which kind of set the stage for this book, which is the one that it's assigned. Uh, and they have to do with passages from the Christian and Catholic mystical tradition that uh, Chrétien uses to sort of illustrate the way in which silence has a very weighty historical um, uh, lineage or uh, pedigree, we could say. And, of course, some of you might be aware that, uh, the, you know, within the Catholic mystical tradition, uh, there is a rich monastic um, legacy, which includes often a discipline of silence to various degrees, some more extreme than others. And so there's already uh, for centuries a legacy of silence having a kind of uh, spiritual positivity. It's not just that silence is just the absence of noise, the absence of speech, but that silence is, is a, um, a good to be cultivated and to be nurtured for, for a spiritual purpose. And that's the basic idea that Chrétien is employing here, uh, that silence has this important spiritual uh, function within this uh, religious tradition. But anyway, I want to say something about the uh, quotations here. In fact, not say something about them, I just want to read them. And you'll be able to, once the transcript is up, you'll be able to pull up the transcript so I don't have to worry about the fact that you do not have the text uh, in front of you. I will read it slowly so it will be hopefully intelligible just as I read it here. And then you can go back and look over the text. But these are passages that uh, Chrétien takes from the mystical tradition. Um, two figures in particular. One is um, Angelus uh, Silesius. Angelus Silesius, who is a German, 17th century German Catholic uh, mystic. It's, uh, I'm going to write this down, so you, I'm sure the uh, transcript will not get that right. Angelus Silesius. There's that. The, uh, the Silesian angel, Silesia is this area of, um, was part of Germany before World War II, now part of uh, the Czech Republic. 
and maybe parts of it are in Poland. Uh, and then another figure, there's another important German mystic uh, named Toiler. That's how you spell his name, Toiler. So those are the, the individuals, if you want to look them up, both really interesting, at least to my mind, if you're interested in mysticism, uh, Christian mysticism, very both very interesting figures uh, to read. Uh, so this is um, what Silesius has to say about what one hears through silence. What one hears through silence. And he says this. So this is uh, Silesius. This is why you must fall silent. Then the word of this birth will be utterable within you and you will be able to hear it. What is this birth? The birth of Christ. But be sure that if you wish to speak, it must be silent. One cannot serve the word better than by keeping quiet and listening. So if you come completely out of yourself, God will enter you entire. The more you come out, the more he will go in. No more, no less. So silence is being equated here with a kind of self-emptying that allows God to enter into the soul. So the, the, the more that you quiet your mind, and of course, you know, in order to be able to quiet your mind, first of all, you need to quiet your mouth, but then also quieting the thoughts of your mind, um, going out of yourself in that sense, right? Your thoughts are leaving you in order for God's thoughts and God's spirit to come into you. So that's a, a good sort of summary of the... Um, importance of silence within this spiritual discipline of seeking God in a kind of mystical fashion. And here's Toiler, the second figure. Quote, it is in the midst of silence, at the very moment when all things are plunged into the greatest silence, where the true silence reigns, it is then that one truly hears the word. For if you wish God to speak, you must be silent. For him to enter, all things must come out. Right, so there you have it even more blatantly, a kind of summary of, of the idea I just expressed, that silence is necessary in order to hear the word of God. Now this naturally raises the question of exactly how this silence is attained. How do we attain this silence? Uh, it's not easy. And what are the um, instruments, so to speak, that we can use to attain this silence? What sort of disciplines can we use to attain this silence? This is a question. Okay. Um, now I want to talk about the second part, which is the notion of silence as excess. So we talk that silence as listening. And then silence as excess. I hope the uh, traffic outside isn't too loud. I have the door open here because my cat is um, wanting to go meet his little friend, the neighbor cat, who's outside. And I don't want to let him out because it's getting dark and I don't want him to be out until 2 a.m. and get eaten by coyotes and raccoons. Um, but if I shut the door, I'm sure he's going to be complaining loudly and that would be even worse. So that's why uh, we're putting up with the... Um, traffic noise tonight. Here we get this idea, in the idea of silence as excess, we get the idea of a mystical silence, a kind of higher silence that is not an absence of speech, so it's not sub-linguistic, but it's super-linguistic. It's a kind of higher meaningfulness that exceeds the puny ability of our language to contain the meaning. So our ordinary sense of silence is that it's a meaninglessness because it's a, a mere privation of the meaning that comes with speech. But this idea of mystical silence is the idea of silence as excess, silence as a higher silence. And here you see in this discussion of excess, you see a point of uh, continuity with Marion's interest in saturation and excess as well. But... Um, 
this is a quotation from um, a scholar, the name doesn't matter so much, about des describing the uh, Neoplatonic philosopher Proclus and this Neoplatonic view of this higher silence. So, quoting, If the one were thought only as silence, it would also be necessary in the silence of the origin as negation of speech to think at one and the same time the positive sense of speech. But this sense, the positive sense of speech, is abolished by the negation of negation in the power of that which lies beyond speech and beyond silence, a power which founds both speech and silence. And this is a direct quotation here from Proclus, the next quotation I'll read, which describes the place or non-place of the soul that has gone beyond itself, which is described in this Neoplatonic tradition as uh, superintellection. So, having reached superintellection, the soul no longer knows itself or anything of that which it once knew. It enjoys the peace that is procured by its proximity to the one. That's the... Um, basically the Neoplatonic God, the one, the oneness of, of reality, sealed off from knowledge, having fallen mute, made silence with an inner silence. And how indeed could it be united with the most ineffable, the most unspeakable of all other than imposing silence on all useless speech within itself? Let her then be one so as to see the one and even better, so as not to see the one, because the one is beyond all the senses and beyond even the ordinary understanding or intellect. So uh, this is this mystical idea of a silence that is a kind of communion with the one. Now, insofar as Neoplatonism is an important influence on early Christian theology, especially mystical theology, and figures like uh, Pseudo-Dionysius, for example, I happen to have these handy just because of where I happen to be sitting. So you got uh, Pseudo Dionysius, if you want to check him out, or uh, Gregory of Nyssa, uh, both deeply influenced by Neoplatonic thought. Uh, and there's a tradition of understanding silence as a kind of higher form of um, intelligibility beyond ordinary speech. Okay, so it's against this background, all of this, what I've just said about the uh, tr Christian mystical tradition, uh, Heidegger, Gadamer, Levinas, Derrida, the, all of this that Chrétien is um, exploring silence and its hospitality. And the question being, what is it to welcome silence? What is it to welcome silence into our mind, in our heart, into our lives? Um, and what is, what is revealed there? What is engaged with there within this silence? And so here uh, we find Chrétien looking at the, in this work, hand to hand, um, the chapter on silence and painting, we find him looking at the painting as a, a reservoir or a site of silence and therefore as a potential entree into this sort of wider mystical consciousness. Okay. So a couple uh, quick, interesting opening remarks here. Um, the first thing he says to set up the possibility of there being a way to speak meaningfully about silence in painting is the way in which it's not just the eyes that are engaged with the painting, but the whole body, when the body is really engaged, dazzled in the way that Marianne describes it, we could say, with the painting, the whole body is involved. It's not just the eyes. So when you're looking at a painting, you're typically moving. You're moving around. You're adjusting your position to try to get the optimal view of the painting. Obviously, the eyes have a kind of controlling um, function, but the body is also involved. The whole body is involved. It's also necessary to, to be quiet and to stay still, to concentrate. Now, that being said, he immediately acknowledges, as he says here in the second paragraph on page 18, silence in the painting seems 
at first to be a vain object for consideration because redundant or tautological. Isn't it obvious that painting neither speaks nor sings? So, you know, the idea is this seems like a non-subject, uh, silence in painting. Yeah, you know, that's like saying paint in painting or canvas in painting or whatever. You know, uh, what's what could be of interest? It's just tautological that it's part of a painting. A painting is not um, an auditory experience. So, um the first thing that he says to break down this natural prejudice is to note that silence is something different from the absence of noise. So on the bottom of 18, uh, first citing Aristotle, but he, he's making the point that the that silence is a silence only for listening. Quoting him here at the bottom of the page and continuing off at the top of 19, a deaf person does not live in a silent world, but rather a world where the difference between the sonorous and the insonorous does not exist, a world that is deprived of sound, but also of silence. So in order to have silence, you also have to have the potential, the possibility of sound. And that would be why the deaf person doesn't have um, the possibility of silence. To say that the painting is silent is to say that we not only see it, but that we listen to it as well. The Eye Listens, a book on painting by Paul Claudel. It's a great title, The Eye Listens. Okay, so this, of course, is still here, just a mere, a mere assertion. What is meant by this? What is it for the eye to listen? Well, we listen by entering into, he says, the active silence of attention. The active silence of attention. There's really two silences here. And here we get back to this structure of call and response that is um, the persistent theme of Cartier's philosophy. So on the call side, there is a silence in the painting. And that calls forth our silence. He says, the essential silence of painting is a communicative, radiant, and cordial silence that invites us to live within it. And that's a phenomenological description. So you have to experience the phenomenon he's, he's um, pointing to in order to be able to, I think, get the sense of this. But I'll read that again. The silence of painting is a communicative, radiant, and cordial silence that invites us to live within it, living within a silence. Uh, and some paintings accomplish this better than others. There are paintings, he says, that are garrulous, speechifying, deafening paintings. Uh, I think particularly here, you think of very didactic paintings would be of this sort. Paintings that are preaching at you or that are putting forth a propagandistic message, which of course is all too common nowadays. Right? We're very familiar with uh, the ways in which we're just sated with the, um, the political relevancy of contemporary art in so many ways. And this is why he's mostly referring back to classical uh, paintings uh, up into the Cubist paintings, which he also finds to have a particular kind of, of silence. The essential silence of a painting is communicative, radiant and cordial that invites us to live in it. But this is not the case with every painting. Not every painting invites us to live in it in this, in this way. There are different ways in which the silence tells itself. He, that's the term he uses, it tells itself in various ways. For example, uh, the silence of death, which also implies the silence, which also implies, of course, the the specter or the existence of life, or the silence of life in relationship to the silence of death. Uh, the silence of absence in relation to the speech of presence or even the silence of presence. And then also in a more religious vein, the silence of anguish within prayer, the silence of God, when um, heaven seems to be deaf to my bootless cries, to quote Shakespeare's Sonnet 29. 
So those are different ways in which the silence tells death and life, presence and absence, anguish and prayer. And I suppose the list could be extended, but those are the ones he, he mentions. So there are different modes of silence, different flavors of silence, if you, if you will, all of which are a real positive realities or actualities, not just privations of sound. Okay, so the first thing he discusses is the um, iconographic silence. Um, I'm going to create some space here and get rid of Gadamer and Heidegger, since I know you all have that tattooed on your brain by now anyway, so we probably don't need to retain this. Um, the iconographic form of silence. What is that? Iconographic. Iconographic silence is the silence that belongs to what makes the image in painting what is given to us to see. What makes the image in painting what is given to us to see. That's the iconographic silence. So the nature of the scene depicted or the manner in which it's depicted would pertain to the iconographic in this sense. Uh, and so some examples of this that he uh, discusses um, a Chardin still life. Um, which contains a kind of mysterious silence to it by the way in which homely everyday objects are depicted or the ways in which a figure is depicted um, doing a silent activity, absorbed activity, like reading a book, for example, a typical uh, Chardin um, subject. And the manner in which it is painted, subdued colors, shadows, um, sort of uh, parsimonious use of light and lighting, for example. So that's iconographic, kind of iconographic silence, the silence that belongs to what makes the image in painting what's given to us to see. The second would be the silence of the pictorial project as such compared to other pictorial projects. So that's the, the second one is the, the silence of the pictorial project itself. Um, It is this sort of silence that George Bataille in his book on Manet describes as having been introduced by Manet, the silence of painting itself. It's continuing to top the top of 21. The various paintings since Manet's time are the various possibilities encountered within this new region where silence reigns profoundly. And for him, this great silence, this passion to reduce to silence in a sort of operation that of which the natural movement is to speak coincides with the birth of modernity in painting. So there's a pictorial project to reduce to silence. And this is initially described as a kind of mystery. Um, but that, that it should be attached to a particular historical epoch is interesting. Um, in Bataille's reading of um, Manet, which Chrétien partially endorses the idea of uh, painting as aiming towards the creation of silence. And we might naturally speculate here, just to get the, um, the brain gears uh, moving, that this sort of project might very well be inspired by the very noisiness, um, and not just in the sense of, of you know, literal sound, but also just in the sense of all of the information, all of the frenetic activity that's characterized, characteristic of modern life. And so painting becomes a kind of refuge from that. That might be one theory that you could have. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be other ones. Uh, but that would be the, the, the second idea that the pictorial project itself becomes aimed at create, create the creation of silence. So those are two ways in which um, silence can be uh, embodied in painting either 
through scene and through manner and, and that might cut across paintings of different historical epochs and different historical genres. And then it can become almost a particular um, genre in its own right, part of a particular pictorial project. Genre is probably too narrow, but part of a pictorial project or, or a theory of art or what art is supposed to accomplish in a particular era, such as ours. Okay. Now, that brings us to the um, major way in which, in the bulk of this essay, uh, Chrétien is uh, exploring in a phenomenological vein the nature of silence in painting, and that is uh, through the idea of silent music. Um, now, if you think of silence as not merely the privation of speech, but as a kind of counterbalance to speech, as a sort of part of speech that enables speech, that even is a, is a kind of origin of speech. That is to say that, you know, there have to be at least relative silences uh, between my words, between my sentences. Uh, there, are, there have to be silences for you to digest what someone is saying. Speech distinguishes itself in opposition to the silence that it arises out of. So in this sense, silence is the other, uh, the other of speech, the kind of yin to its yang. And in that perspective, then, it would seem like the, the epitome of silence would be the sort of counterbalancing force to the epitome of um, language, the most expressive language, the highest form of linguisticality, which often is identified with music. Music is described as the universal language. Music is understood as being the most expressive language. Of course, from another perspective, you can view music as a, as a severely impoverished language, or even as not a language at all, um, simply because it can be given you know, so many different interpretations in terms of what it means intelligibly. But we'll leave that question to one side here. Here's what Chrétien says on 21. To attempt to clear a path, it is just as well to go straight to the point, which is to say, as always, paradoxically, by meditating upon silent music. What could be more silent indeed than a silent music, an unheard or insonorous music? Silent music is the very music of silence, silence as music. So make of that what you will. <laughs> Um, there's a density, there's a singular density, dens density to the silence in music. What is this silent music? I don't think he's completely made this intelligible, but he gives us some examples, so we should be thankful for that. Um, now, the first thing that might come to mind when you think about silent music is the ways in which um, music has been depicted silently in other artistic media. Uh, and before discussing painting and the way in which music is depicted within painting silently, he discusses the way in which it is depicted in uh, poetry. And in particular, uh, what could be a better example, a better instance of this than John Keats' uh, Ode on a Grecian Urn um, so, thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silent and slow time. Hopefully you know this poem. If you don't, uh, call it up on Google. I'm sure you can find it, find it on a Poetry Foundation and many other places. It's a short enough poem. But the poem is a, is a poetic meditation on the scene, which is a kind of painting depicted on a Greek urn. Uh, which includes scenes of, of music, but of course the music is silent. What does this mean to Keats? Um, there are a number of things that Cartian draws from this. One of this, one is the idea that we've also saw, seen versions of in Marion that the the artist, in this instance, it's a poet rather than a painter, but that the artist is uh, in a receptive posture. The bottom on 22, at the bottom of the first paragraph, uh, first complete paragraph, he says, to address a visible work is to see while listening to 
or to listen to while seeing its silence. Only this listening can give the poet speech. He does not take speech, he receives it. And there you see, again, this idea that I mentioned before on Chrétien of call and response. Uh, so the poet does not take speech, he receives it. The, the speech is a response to what is received from the, uh, in this case, the work of art, the urn that calls forth this speech from the poet. He receives it, he goes on to say, in an act of listening to a silence that is worthy of obedience. And that's the first word of, of um, St. Benedict's rule for monks, which is uh, listen, which is a, a word that is also related to the word for obey or be obedient. So be, be, obedience and listening. Obedience is the, one of the great virtues of uh, uh, monasticism, um, the communal form of, of monasticism, at least. And so the listening is a listening not, not only to your religious superior, but also to your brothers within the monastic community, and ultimately all, all in the service of listening to God. That's the, the first duty is to listen. And so the, the poet is in a kind of uh, monastic position here as a listener, um, a kind of uh, position of, of a religious novice or neophyte that is prepared to be initiated into uh, an esoteric wisdom through this work of art. He receives it in an act of listening to a silence that is worthy of obedience, for he knows from the beginning the unevenness between what he sees and what he says. There's more in the urn for Keats than what he can what he can express, and so just like there's more wisdom in the guru at whose feet you sit than there is in you, uh, and so that's why you listen. You listen to be instructed. Okay. On 23, he broaches this idea of silent music being the essence of music. And Keats, uh, there's this idea that the, the music that is unheard, that is interrupted in, in an instant as it's depicted on the urn, is a kind of eternal music. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of perfection of music. This might seem paradoxical and even really nonsensical or oxymoronic. Um, but here's what Chrétien says about this on 23. Silence here forms a superior music, and as one of Keats' commentators says, not to hear is to hear most essentially. At issue in this silent music is not an oxymoron, but rather the essence of music. This music avoids any alteration and becomes an ever vibrant music because forever new. As the third stanza says, thus evoking the happy melodist unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new. This music has been interrupted and immobilized by the image, like the gesture of a lover that will never touch the beloved, becomes for Keats a perennial and uninterrupted music, the music of silence itself. Music prior to and following the sounds that resonate. And that's the key conclusion here. Uh, music prior to and following the sounds that resonate. That's why I discussed this uh, idea of silence as excess, from uh, the chapter called Hospitality of Silence in Arc of Speech, because it's this silence, the silence of excess, that is being referred to here, I think. The idea that there's a kind of um, pregnancy of meaning that is excessive to the meaning that is found within the music that resonates in our ears, that this music is, is striving to achieve the, the eternal. Um, well, there are other instances of this. This is, isn't an idea peculiar just to Keats. Uh, Mallarmé's um, poem on St. Cecilia, the patroness of musicians, describes St. Cecilia as the musician of silence. And there's a call, a kind of Levinasian ethical call that uh, Rilke, as well as Keats, find in uh, the work of art, 
that's being listened to in this uh, poetic way. So the Ode to a Grecian Urn famously ends, uh, beauty is truth, truth is beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. Uh, Rilke's poem on a torso of Apollo, the sculpture, ends with you must change your life, uh, another famous pronouncement. So in both cases, there's there's this sort of almost, you know, kind of um, pontificating about the work of art. He describes it as a, as a um, um, imperative sort of statement, imperious, imperious, an imperious tone is taken, like the tone of an emperor declaring this is the way it is. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty, and that's all you need to know. You must change your life in Rilke's poem. So that's, it's this call. It's, it's got the force of a kind of ethical call in the way that the face does for loving us. I think we can f uh, make that connection with a, um, a fair amount of assurance. Okay, so um, this brings us to d discussion of, well, he, there's a brief discussion of uh, Potter on the school of Giorgione, um, the life on the life of, of music, but more time is spent on the depiction of instruments in painting, uh, both being played and also as uh, still lifes. And I hope you will call up some of these paintings. There's the one by uh, Claude Lorraine, the um, pastoral landscape with Piping Shepherd, which is a very, uh, very beautiful painting, very enjoyable. Uh, Thomas Eakin's Arcadia, uh, very different paintings, and they, they serve sort of complementary functions in the analysis that Chrétien puts forth. The Lorraine painting suggests the way, he says, the entire work rests upon the tension between the ideal spectator of the landscape and the tenuousness of the sound of the flute. The Lorraine painting is one where there's this vast landscape and um, a small figure playing a flute, and you, you get the sense of silence in the way in which the, the sound of the flute is sort of just absorbed in the landscape. Um, whereas the Eakins painting is an intimate painting. They're basically, you have these three nude figures um, who are outdoors, but you get the sense that, you know, they're at home there. You don't get the sense that these figures have a house. They probably just live outside. They're very natural creatures. That's why they're nude. Um, they're representing these kind of natural creatures. Um, like wood nymphs or fairies. Uh, and the, the, the music there, he says, is convey, it conveys the silence of intimacy, where he says, the point here is not to listen to the silence of nature, but to show nature herself listening. Nature herself listening. Uh, that's on page uh, 26 and 27. Uh, he describes nature as listening in that Eakins painting. This is on 27, about um, 10 lines from the top. Nature herself listening, discreet, unobtrusive. Nature become all hearing, nothing more than a sensual and unreal decor for man. Um, and then Picasso's Flute of Pan, which portrays bodies that Cartier describes as architectural and hieratic bodies. The form of the body is, is a silent music. So uh, I encourage you to look at these paintings and connect them with his words because the, the, the method of philosophy here is phenomenological. These words don't really find a lot of purchase unless you can, can connect them to an experience of these paintings. And I, I checked, all of these are readily accessible in um, excellent dis digital reproductions uh, just by Googling the titles as they appear here. And it begins to give you a sense of what he's describing as, as the silence of the painting in these cases. Um, I guess we could summarize, since we're just about out of time, summarize on page 28, the initial idea that these examples are meant to illustrate uh, is stated here, I would say, in the first complete paragraph, the second paragraph of, of 28. He says, this musical silence 
inhabiting so many paintings down through the centuries, incarnates in its very paradox, veritable silence even more than any explicit invitation to quiet oneself, such as the placing of a raised index finger against the lips. Um, so silence is conveyed precisely by drawing your attention to the fact of music and music in, in all of its sort of naked reality, the, its naked embodied character, its um, naturalness, uh, its intimacy with nature, and also its um, being absorbed into nature in the three examples we discussed. In all of those cases, our attention is being drawn to music rather than um, being, as it were, uh, drawn to silence qua silence as the prohibition on speech in a negative mode. So the, the positivity of silence comes out through the form of a painting, which, which draws our attention to music and musicality in a way that, of course, doesn't present anything literally to the ears. And so that, in Cretien's analysis, is the more effective way of um, rendering silence phenomenologically than it would be to have some kind of conventional gesture of silence, like covering the mouth or something like that. Or saying, shh. Okay. So that gets us started on silence and painting. So we'll finish this chapter next time, and then we'll spend a further chapter on the somewhat shorter uh, second Oh, sorry, so we'll spend a further video on the somewhat shorter second uh, chapter that we're going to be uh, excerpting from this work, um, which is more explicitly religious still. So, uh, till next time.